I tell you what, that new hymn, two weeks in a row, I am fired up after singing it. I mean, it's like, let's preach the word and let's go tell some folks about Jesus. What do y'all think? Oh man, that's good. So turn your Bibles to Psalm 63, and I'm going to have my Psalm 63 ladies come up. Did you know we have a Psalm 63 ladies bunch? And I'm going to go and have them come up. So we've got them all here except for two, I think. Juliana and Lydia were not able to come. Y'all come stand over here by this mic. So these girls have been going through for six weeks, seven weeks, nine weeks. (laughs) For nine weeks, they've been studying in depth Psalm 63. Um, they've been studying the, the context of it. Um, it's been really good just helping them understand how to study the Scripture and apply the Scripture. Um, but So I told them, since they've been studying it so hard, that I would preach on it. And so, honestly, when I've been talking to Mercy and some of the other girls, I'm like, y'all know this text better than I do. And so, at one point this week, I wanted to grab their book they've been using and uh, use it as my uh, sermon prep, but I didn't. So, but I probably should have. So, so turn with me to Psalm 63. If you don't have your Bible open, turn to Psalm 63. And these um, wonderful young women are going to say it by memory as you read along, as you follow along. So turn with me to Psalm 63, and then whenever you are ready. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live, in your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food, and my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed, and meditate on you in the watches of the night, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you, your right hand upholds me. Those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult. For the mouths of liars will be stopped. Father, we praise you that um, in your great love for us, Um, one of the major ways that you loved us was giving us the full revelation of your son Jesus in the word of God. And so we praise you for that. As we study this psalm this morning, Lord, it's a psalm that has been sang and read and memorized throughout the history of your church, Lord. I pray that you use it today, Lord, uh, for your glory and for your renown, Lord. I pray that you use it today, Lord, to draw us closer to you. I pray that you use it today, Lord, so that Others may know of the love that we have in you. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Super proud of y'all. Why? So Andrea didn't want to give a high five. So I don't know how I feel about that, Marlon. So. Psalm 63, Psalm 63. So as I said, this is a psalm that has much history within the life of the church. Um, Psalm 63 um, has a regular rhythm throughout church history of a daily psalm. Um, So when you're looking at something that you want to learn to grow and pray, Psalm 63 is a great one to read every day. I mean, it truly is. Um, It gives you a great picture of what it means to worship the Lord in the desolate wilderness of your soul to the abundance as well. And so I encourage you to do that. Um, 
to put this psalm into play in your life, into your study habits, into your... Um, it's just a beautiful psalm. So the psalm begins um, with a heading that says, A Psalm of David, uh, when he was in the wilderness of Judah. In verse 9, though, we see... Um, but those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. So because of that, we know that at some point, this is a psalm when David was a fugitive of some type. He was being chased in the wilderness. And while our instant inclination is to say that this may be in a time when he was in the wilderness due to being pursued by King Saul, when Saul was trying to kill him, Verse 11 gives us a better picture of that context when he says, But the king shall rejoice in God, and all who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars shall be stopped. So with that being the picture, we know that it cannot be Saul, the time when King Saul was pursuing him, because David was already king at this point. So as we studied in Psalm 3, we know that this is the time when his son Absalom uh, tried to overtake the throne. In fact, as we studied, when we studied Psalm 3, 2 Samuel 15, 23 says, David fled the city, crossed the brook Kindron, and went into the wilderness. And so this is the picture that we're experiencing today of King David's life, a time when his very son has betrayed him, and he's in the wilderness of Judah. And that's where we find David singing this psalm today. It's as if all the legs have been knocked un out from under him. All his support, all the blessings that David walked in have been withdrawn, and he's in the wilderness. You even see it in the title, When He Was in the Wilderness of Judah. And it's in that setting that this beautiful psalm comes from the heart from the very mouth of King David. And of course we know, as we spoke of last week, ultimately this comes from the heart of God as God's Holy Spirit inspired David to write this psalm. Once again, we see God bringing the best out of David in the absolute worst of times. Few other psalms match the devotional expressions of this psalm. The words should really challenge our desire for praise in every circumstance. In this psalm, David expresses to us three things. He expresses to us his thirst for God. He expresses to us his sustainment in God. And finally, he expresses his absolute trust in God. In fact, each of these three stanzas follow along those very lines. If you look at verses 1 through 4, you will see David's thirst for God. If you look at verses 5 through 8, you see this express his desire for God in abundance and in drought. The second portion, you'll see David express his satisfaction in God. He not only longs for God, but he is satisfied. In God. Those are two very different things. <clears throat> he finds all his longings met in God. And then finally, verses 9 through 11, the third portion of this psalm, you see David affirm his trust in the Lord. The Lord God is the one in whom he trusts. And David has words for us today in whatever wilderness you may find yourself. David again is being tested. And once again, God is using the worst circumstances to bring out the good and the glory of his work. So let's dig in. Let's look at verses 1 through 4 first. O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. 
my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. I wonder if we can possibly imagine where David is when he says these words. Because David at this point has been reigning as as king of Jerusalem for many years. David has been extraordinarily blessed by God. But ever since the sin of David with Bathsheba, there have been great trials in David's life. Do you realize that after David's sin with Bathsheba, he lost four children? There would be many trials in David's life after that great sin. Though he was forgiven by God, and though he was welcomed back into that fellowship, and though God's mercy and the joy of his salvation was restored, that did not eliminate the trials from his life. And that's an important lesson we must always walk in. Many times trials are just evidence of God's movement. But once again, as I talked about last week, the prosperity gospel has completely perverted the movement of God. As if if you're not prospering, God's not moving. That's not what the scriptures teach. In fact, God's greatest movement is right in the middle of your persecution and trial. In David's situation here, one of his own children, I think about that as having three boys, one of his own children turns against him, rallies some of his leading men of the kingdom against him, and David has to flee. David has to flee from Jerusalem. His son takes some of David's very concubines up on the rooftop of the palace and has relations with him. And that's a significant picture there. It's absolutely horrifying thought for David. Because you go back to the picture of David's own lusting that day on the rooftop, it's a reminder of his sin and it had to be like triplicated before David's mind. He He was driven out of the land. He's not the king on the throne any longer. And worse for David, he's not just that he's in the wilderness. It's that he's been separated from the things that he holds so close. His power and his rule. He's been separated from the temple in which he worshipped God. The temple of God. Which easily would make him feel separated from the praise of God, you would think. And it's there in the wilderness with his rebellious son reigning in Jerusalem that David sings the words, the opening words of this song. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. O God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. Is that your immediate response to trial and the wilderness that you walk in? All the support and resources have been taken from David. Everything has gone wrong. All the blessings that seem to have been his have been lost. But David's response is what? O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. David is telling us here that in spite of having everything lost, he longs for one thing, and that's the Lord. He thirsts for God. What David wants most in his life is fellowship with God. Now, if you think about it, if you had lost everything, what would be the one thing that you would want? If you lose everything, what would be the one thing that you 
would want. You know, it really tells a lot about a person how they respond in seasons of adversity. I love what John Calvin wrote on this this topic. He says, There are some people who are religious on the exterior, but they lack a true knowledge, a true saving knowledge of God. And the closer they are to religious ceremonies, the more spiritual they feel and the more they seem to long after God. But remove them from religious ceremonies and their zeal for God vanishes. You can really see the fruit of someone when adversity comes. And then he points out, look at David. Look at the fruit that he has shown here. David is separated from the religious ceremonies. He's separated from the fellowship that he had within the temple. But his heart still longs for God. His testimony to the reality of this grace is at the center of David's heart. He longs for God. Notice the very first words of this psalm. O God, you are my God. In the Hebrew, it's Elohim, you are my Eli. It is a personal, it is a personal prayer. The I thou relationship between David and God at the heart of his devotion. And as David proclaims this, he's got to remember the covenant promise that God gave to the Israelites. Exodus 6 says, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. And you shall know that I am the Lord your God, who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And David is here affirming that very thing. Lord, you are my God. You are my God. It's not that you're just our God. No, Lord, you are my God. Elohim, you are my Eli. And David professes that here at the very heart of this psalm. In fact, the statement here in verse 1 and then the statement in verse 3 give us an anchor to this entire psalm. Verse 1, as we've read it a couple times, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And then look at verse 3. Because of your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will what? They will praise you. They will praise you. David will bless God because of God's covenant love. Because of his loving kindness. Because of his loving faithfulness. David knows God. He knows that he's present. He knows that he walks with him. He knows that he goes before him in every circumstance. And David's longings must force us to a question. What are we after? I want you to ask yourself that. What am I after? What are we truly chasing after? What do we really want? Because David here says he wants God. But what do we really want? In circumstances like David's, when you've lost everything... It brings you to a point where you have to give a real answer to that question. You do. When you've lost everything, you move to a place where you really have to give a real answer to that question. Not a Sunday school church answer. Is he your God? Is he your longing? Does your soul truly thirst for him? Over the years, I've had the opportunity um, to minister to people through many, many difficult moments. 
those who have literally lost everything. And not to minimize any of them, I've, I've walked with people who have lost multi, multi-million dollar businesses. I've lost people who, I've worked with people who have lost their homes. I've worked with people who have lost a baby. I've walked, I've walked with people who have lost, their, lost a child, who have lost a spouse. And in those moments, you get a few different responses. But you really get to see the fruit of their life. In those moments, what, what is your response in the Lord? Is it a response of worship? Is it one of seeking? Is it a time when you're seeking the Lord's will? Lord, why? But I trust you. What does the Lord want to teach me in this wasteland, in this devastating wilderness? What do I need to do, Lord, to follow you more deeply? Lord, how would you have me respond to this wilderness? Because David has lost everything. And he gives one response. Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. And brothers and sisters, this is a true picture of worship. Because you worship the one thing that you really want. Did you know that? You worship the one thing you really want. What do you worship the most? Worship is about saying this person, this thing, this experience, this whatever it is that matters the most to me. That's worship. Worship is of the highest value of your life. For some of you, that one thing may be a relationship. It may be a dream job. It may be a a new position at your current job. It may be a status. It may be something you own. It might be a name. It might be a job. It might be a kind of pleasure that you have. But whatever that thing is, whatever that thing is that you have concluded in your heart is the most worth to you, that is what you worship. Whatever it is, that is what you worship. Worship is, in essence, declaring that you va- whatever you value the most. So what do you value the most? As a result, worship fuels all of our actions. It becomes the driving force of all that we do. Because every person worships something. You know that? Every person worships something. There are many souls proclaiming with every breath what they worship. It doesn't take long to see it walking down, walking down a hiking trail in the business world. It's very easy to identify what someone worships. What is their affection? What, it, what draws their attention? What has their allegiance? That, in fact proclaims what they worship. And this is a hard truth, church, but it is true. Everyone has an altar, and every altar has a throne. And so how, you, so how do you know where and what you worship? That's got to be the question ringing in your mind. So how do you know where and what you worship? It's actually very easy. You follow the trail of your time and your affection and your energy and your money and your allegiance. And at the end of that trail, you will find your throne. Whatever or whoever is on that throne is what is of the highest value to you. On that throne is what you worship. Of course, not many of us 
are honest to walk around and say, I worship my stuff. We're just not. We're not honest enough to say, I worship my job. Because I can remember the season when I did that. I remember when I was a building principal. I wanted to have the greatest school in the area. I wanted to be the supreme private school, the best college prep school. I went to conferences. Everything was about that end. And it was, in fact, what I worshipped. When you looked at my calendar, it was full of meetings. Every 30 minutes on the hour, I met with parents and stakeholders. Every minute. And it was my worship. It had my full allegiance. And guess what? It was sin in my life. It was sin in my life. But many of us are not willing to talk about the things that hold our allegiance, the things that are most important to us, our stuff, our job, our pleasures, our hobbies, him or her, our relationships, or your own body. Or what about yourself? But the trail never lies, church. The trail never lies. Our calendar never lies on what holds our allegiance. Our hobbies never lie. We may say we value this thing or that thing more than that, but the volume of our actions speak louder than words. We worship what matters most to us. And David is telling us here, the thing that matters the most to me, the thing that I want most, is God. David is proclaiming to God, you can take my kingdom, you can take my throne, you can take my very life, but you, O oh God, sustain me. And his words are very important to us today. Here in the worst circumstances, God brings out the best in David. And David expresses his thirst for the living God. David displays for us here a full surrender and devotion. Look at verses 3 and 4. They're perhaps some of the more beautiful, bold words of surrender in the entire Scripture. Look at verses 3 and 4. Because your steadfast love is better than what? Better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will what? I will lift my hands. This proclamation is what some throughout church history have called the martyr's prayer. It's a prayer for those who have totally surrendered their entire lives to the work and the glory of the Lord Jesus. Their entire life, church. Not just a corner, not just a Sunday morning show up occasionally. Their entire life is about the glory and the renown of Christ. This is the prayer David prays here. Because your steadfast life is better than life. Better than life better than my hobbies and my desires, better than my family. You, God, are better than all of those things. Better. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. This proclamation here, as you can see why it has the label as the martyr's prayer. Because there are those who have put full on display what it means to totally surrender to their call in Jesus. And it takes them to the very end of their days. This is a picture of the new creation. Remember, we talked about this at length in the book of Ephesians. This idea of full surrender, this idea of full surrender, that God, you are my very life, it only can happen if you are a born-again follower of Christ. It's only possible in the new creation. Those who have been born again and understand that their life is not their own. Their pursuits are not their own. Their possessions are not their own. Their very life 
is not their own. Because you see, in just the very simple basics of the gospel message, we are separated from God because of our sin. Paul, Paul said in, in Ephesians 2, we were dead. That doesn't mean that you're reaching for a life raft. We talked about this, right? You're laying dead at the bottom of the ocean. But God, He sent His Son Jesus to live a life we were unable to live. A life of full, complete righteousness. Full surrender to the Father's will. He died a death that you and I deserve because of our sin. The wrath of God that you and I deserve was placed on Him. He conquered the physical and the spiritual death that came from the curse of Adam. And all who place their faith in Him are born again. The old passes away, church, and the new has come. And because of this, because of the gospel, because of the work of Christ, if you are born again, this should be your song. Because your steadfast love is better than life. This should be your song. You see, our our life, our days, are no longer our own. We have been crucified with Christ. The Apostle Paul reminds us that in Galatians 2. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave Himself up for me. David here gives us a complete picture of the gospel. You see, because of the work of Christ, because of the new identity, this is our daily song, church. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless your name as long as I live. Church, is this your posture? Or do you still believe that your life is your own? Do you believe that your life is your own to control and pursue your own dreams and passions? Or have you been crucified with Christ? So we're not here all day. I should move on. I should have just taken a portion of this psalm, I think. So let's look at verses 5 through 8. For God alone... Oh, wrong psalm. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. And my mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night... For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. You see, David not only longs for God and thirsts for God, he is fully satisfied in God. But he doesn't just thirst for that living God. It says that he's satisfied. He not only longs for God but he truly enjoys God. Do you know the difference in that? Not just longing for God to fix your problems, but truly satisfied and joy in his fellowship. God is the very thing that we treasure. And again, David presses that question on us. What do you treasure most? David says he treasures God, that he's satisfied in God. Verse 5 says, My soul is satisfied as with marrow and fatness, and my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Did you notice the contrast there between verse 1 and verse 5? He says, My soul thirsts for you. And then verse 5, My soul is satisfied with marrow and fatness. He longs for God on one hand, but is satisfied for God in the other. How beautiful is that? He finds all of his longings met with more of God. He worships God in the wilderness, but he also worships God in the abundance of who he is. God is his full sustainment. A Puritan pastor, I love what a Puritan pastor William Guthrie wrote. He said, It's the experience of the Christian to be able to say of Christ, Less 
would not satisfy, more is not desired. And David is saying that. He is saying, I long for someone who is God, and I am satisfied in someone, and that someone is God as well. I love what John Piper wrote on this this very sermon that he preached. He speaks of the authentic inner essence of worship. And Piper writes, he says, It's the essence of worship to be satisfied with Christ, to prize Christ and to cherish Christ and to treasure Christ. It's the essence of worship to be satisfied with Christ, to prize Christ, to cherish Christ and to treasure Christ. And then the next sentence he says, this definition of inner essence of worship encompasses all of our life and flows directly from the heart. David is telling us here what he treasures. So I ask you again, write it in your journal. What do I treasure the most? Do I find my full satisfaction in God? We don't simply long for Him. We find our satisfaction in Him. David is telling us that he is satisfied in God because church, in Christ, we should thirst for God. In Christ, we should long for God. In Christ, we are satisfied in the Lord. We enjoy His fellowship above all others. A few weeks ago, we talked about one of the shorter, the number, the first catechism of the shorter catechisms, and the question is, what is the chief end of man? And the answer to that question is that we glorify God and we enjoy Him forever. What is the chief end of man? to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that's what David is speaking of here. He longs to glorify God and find enjoyment in Him and Him alone. Look at verse 9. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Not only does David thirst for God, not only is he fully satisfied in God, David trusts God. David says there, he says, those who seek who seek my life to destroy it, in verse 9, will go into the depths of the earth. He says three things there about his enemies to take note of. He says they're going to go to a place of the dead. He says they're going to be slain in battle. And then he says they're going to have their lying mouth stopped by the Lord. David trusts God to fight his battles. Now David has no circumstantial assurance of this But all that he knows is that God is faithful and he fully trusts him. When things really go bad, who do you trust? I'm talking about when the wheels fall off and everything falls apart, who do you trust? One of the greater sins of my life, of my adult life, has the answer has always been myself. When the wheels fall off, I know what to do, and I trust me. And that's sin, church. If we are hidden in Him and He is our identity, if our trust goes immediately to ourselves, we don't trust Him. We don't trust Him. But many times we trust our own wisdom, right? We trust our own plan. We trust and someone else to get us out of it. But our call as a new creation is to trust in the Lord. David trusts in God in all circumstances. And because he trusts in God, he's able to rejoice in God. He contrasts himself in verses 9 to 11 with those that are scheming against him. 
And he says, the king will rejoice and glory in God. Don't miss that, that part. The king will rejoice. They're scheming against me, God. They're coming after me. They're, they're trying to get me in the, in the watches of the night, right? But he says, the king will rejoice and glory in God. Why? Because David knows that divine grace always overcomes evil. He's seen it happen in his life over and over again. He knows that he's going to do it in this circumstance. And so for David, he's able to trust God. He longs for God. He's satisfied in God. Notice that these longings of the heart are not kept to himself. And that's really important here. They're expressed publicly. So you see, for instance, in verse 3, he says, My lips will praise you. I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. And he declares again that the king will rejoice in God in verse 11. David is not satisfied simply in his heart to long for God and to be satisfied in God. No, David said, I'm going to express it publicly. I'm going to make the name of Jesus known in spite of my wilderness. That's such a great lesson for those who go into the wilderness and you never see them again. Now this psalm shows us the experience of longing for God when everything has been taken away, when everything else has been taken away. The great trial that we face today is this. Because we have so much, because we do, like in the country we live in, we walk in great abundance. Great abundance. And because we walk in so much, many times we confuse the gift with the giver. And we so enjoy the gifts that we have been given by the giver that we begin to prefer the gift over the giver. That's what Paul talks about in Romans 1 and 2. And that's how God... But you've been, you've been called to live differently, church. You've been called to be satisfied in God and God alone. Because guess what? These gifts, these nice cars we drive in, these nice homes that we live in, they're temporary. And they don't mean anything. But our sustainment and our trust in the, the one who we will live with forever means everything. Because the truth of it is, and as I told you, the day that you interviewed me, the, the search committee interviewed me, my role in your life is to teach you to suffer well. Because trials are coming. Hurt is coming. Sickness is coming. You will lose everything. This country will collapse. Where do you find your hope when it does? Where do you find your sustainment when it does? What do you cling to when it does? Because church is not if, it's when. Because we live in a fallen, broken world. Church, our hearts should be restless until we find rest in Him. Let us love and serve and long for and be satisfied with our King. Let our daily prayer be this prayer of King David. Like seriously, write this, write verses 3 and 4 everywhere in your house. Write it on the dash of your car. Write it in your mirror as you're getting ready in the morning. Because your steadfast love is better than life, my lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. Church, let this be the prayer of your heart. Let me pray for us.